It's time for some more XKCD. Specifically, what if you use a flamethrower as a snowblower? Well, it'd be highly inefficient, kind of like nuclear fusion. Those of you who don't know me, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry. From engineering operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Let's see. This question comes from Matt, who asks, I've long thought about putting a flamethrower on the front of a car a to car. melt snow and ice before you drive across it. Now, I've realized that a flamethrower is impractical, <laughs> but what about a high-powered microwave emitter? What? <laughs> yes, a flamethrower is highly impractical because it's not terribly energy efficient at doing what you're supposed to do. But a microwave emitter? Arguably even more energy inefficient. <laughs> Believe it or not, Matt, your flamethrower idea is actually the more practical of the two. Yes. <laughs> the flamethrower also has the advantage that, unlike the microwave, it won't interfere with Wi-Fi. Yes. Unless you aim it directly at the router. Yeah, you won't aggravate the uh, FCC. I originally researched this question in the winter of 2015, when Boston was buried under a truly ridiculous amount of snow. Good time. We'd had more snow it. in 30 days than Anchorage, Alaska usually gets in an entire winter. Wow. Our transit system had broken. Nuclear power plants do have their own snow and cold weather procedures. Though, the nuclear power plant I worked at was in Texas, so we didn't have to implement them that much, but more than you might expect. And there were times where snow can really be a problem, and a lot of it is going to be solved by, by heat tracing a lot of our pipes. And we're talking many thousands of miles of heat trace for a typical nuclear power plant, as well as space heaters, um, insulations, protective coverings. There's a lot of winter preparedness that has to go down. And what's funny is the winter preparedness um, preventive maintenance schedule, you ensure you have all of your freeze protection stuff on site, and it's usually the summer of. So when it is absolutely wretched hot, and we're talking 110, 125 degrees Fahrenheit of heat index in Texas, that's when you start thinking about your cold weather protection. And your hot weather protection, usually the preparation starts in the winter time because you just want to make sure you're that prepared that early, well before the high risk of those things happening. But it's, it can get kind of annoying carrying around a bunch of insulation when it's hot broken down and our roofs were collapsing. The mayor gave a press conference in which he actually announced, I don't know what to say to anybody anymore. Hopefully it will stop eventually. So snow removal was on our minds. That being said, I'm, I, know, I know at nuclear power plants up north, it's, it's a much bigger deal to prepare for blizzards than it is to prepare for hurricanes. However, snow is hard to melt. Your microwave idea certainly yes. sounds like it should be more practical than a flamethrower because microwaves are clean and efficient. No, snow is actually hard. I mean, wa it's still water. Water has a high heat capacity. And going back to microwaves, snow isn't the best conductor of microwave energy. Ice is going to reflect microwaves a lot more than it absorbs compared to liquid water. Not to mention, it's fluffy constantly moving stuff, meaning the heat's not going to build up. It's going to kind of move around a bit as you heat the stuff up. So it's a horribly inefficient process. After all, we don't use flamethrowers in our kitchens, usually. But there That's is a big idea. problem. Sorry, Microwaves heat does. liquid water very well, but they work very poorly on frozen yeah. water, which is one reason that defrosting food evenly in your microwave can be tricky. Fortunately, yes. there's- That's why I'm not a fan of hot pockets. It's either boiling lava hot or ice cold. There are other ways to get energy into snow. In addition to your flamethrower suggestion, you could, for example, use infrared heat lamps or lasers. Mm -hmm. But whatever you use, you'll run into an even bigger problem. It's just going to reflect it back at you, and it's going to heat the air up as, as well. So you, don't, you really don't want to stand that close to it if this is the scale. <laughs> It takes an awful lot of energy to melt snow. Yeah. Melting a gram of snow takes about 335 joules of energy. Mm -hmm. To put that another way, a 60-watt incandescent light bulb is capable of melting about a pound of snow an hour. Or if it's a 60-watt equivalent LED bulb, it's only capable of melting a pound of snow every <laughs> second. I love this, because, yes, they market it as 60 watts because it has similar capacity when it should just be in lumens, because really, you said 60 watts is, is like, what, a, an 8 or a 10? depending on things. Six or seven hours. Either way, this is a case where a light bulb does not represent a good idea. A foot of snow contains roughly the same amount of water as an inch of rain, give or take. So let's assume you've had a decent snowstorm of about a- Yeah, that's about right. And that's because snow is not terribly dense compared to water, and also in terms of um, 
specific heat. And yeah, it's all slushy and kind of goes everywhere. So this is a big, big simplification because we're talking about concentrated versus not concentrated. Foot, meaning an inch worth of water, and that you want to melt a nine foot wide swath while driving along at 55 miles an hour. 55 miles per hour, okay. So not, not 88 miles per hour? Okay. <laughs> I think they're going for efficiency here. 55 to 60 miles per hour for a typical car is about where you're, where you're going to be the most efficient. Give or take. If you're annoyed by mixing all these different conflicting units, this happens to be one of those happy physics situations that I love where we can just multiply together every number we're looking at in an online calculator that handles <laughs> units for us, and that's the answer true. turns out to be the... Ooh, that's a big one. 574 megawatts, which is more than a small modular nuclear reactor. It's about half the electrical output of a typical nuclear reactor. And I say electrical output is about a gigawatt on the grid. What they're actually producing is well over three gigawatts or 3,000 megawatts. So, I mean, here we're just talking about making heat, no need to convert it to electricity. If that is to say, if you could somehow turn nuclear heat directly into projected fire, I mean, it's still not going to be 100% efficient, but... ...measurement we want. We need 574 megawatts of power. That's a lot. Unfortunately, that is not the answer we'd like. <laughs> the nuclear reactor on an aircraft carrier, yes. for example, produces less than 200 megawatts. There are some that can produce more than that, but typically, yes. They're on the order of 125, 150, and subs are even smaller. To melt snow in front of your car, you'd need three of those. Which... <laughs> well, they're, they're chained together. Oh, that's the little car behind it to scale. Okay, so you have to pull those. Yeah. See, this is where it comes in. You're getting the impracticality of nuclear fusion rearing its ugly head and that it's going to take so much more energy than you would get out of this thing. So, and a lot of that is because said flamethrower, as much of the energy is just going to heat the air. And depending on how cold it is, the melting turns the snow back into water and then it's just going to refreeze behind the vehicle, which is now solid ice. Eventually. Again, it depends how cold it is, but I'm going to assume it's well below freezing. So that's arguably making it more dangerous compared to just sticking to a snow plow and pushing the snow out of the way. Sometimes moving is actually better than melting. Which could lead to its own problems. What about your original like flamethrower idea? Gasoline may have a phenomenally high energy density, but it is not high enough. No, it's not. And even back to the microwave idea, it's also even less practical because you're going to need gigawatt scale focused beams. So forget this, forget um, daisy chaining aircraft carriers. You're going to need some of those crazy satellite power transmission concepts. And this is still going to take hundreds of megawatts. Again, it kind of depends on the depth as well as the density. And you're probably going to exceed some limits by a few orders of magnitude as far as safe exposure to microwave radiation. Now, it's non-ionizing radiation, so you're not looking at, say, radiation poisoning. You're just looking at a lot of heat. And again, a lot of this is going to be reflected back toward you. So shielding the occupants as well as the electronic systems for this vehicle and any vehicles that happen to be anywhere close to you, it's... uh. Yeah, you're essentially making a mobile EMP toaster. No matter how big the tank on your flamethrower is, you'll run out of fuel constantly. Gas mileage in the US is often measured in miles per gallon yeah. of gasoline. Are you going to put a refueling tanker <laughs> up to this? I mean, you already put aircraft carriers. You could fill the aircraft carriers up with uh, gasoline. With your flamethrower guzzling fuel, your mileage would be about 17, 17 feet, feet per, per gallon. gallon. <laughs> and you'd be using up fuel at a rate of almost five gallons per second. Your speed's kind of irrelevant at this point, because the speed of the vehicle, I mean, it's, your fuel economy is going to go up even if the thing was turned off just by attaching a ridiculous thing to you or tethering said aircraft carriers behind you. But yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. You'd probably be better off dropping the melting idea entirely and taking a cue from rail agencies who use jet engine powered snowblowers to clear train tracks. In the end, it's <laughs> easier to just move the snow out of your way. Yeah, it is, and that's why snow plows are a thing. Fraction of energy. Um, so, in megawatts, we're talking um, 0 0.01 to 0 0.03 in megawatts or kilowatts or horsepowers, which are the normal units of measurement for uh, cars. 
Yeah, it's lunacy. It's complete lunacy. But what if we took the lunacy even crazier at, like, what this channel is known for? What if you just straight up tried to induce nuclear fusion with this? I mean, after all, every kilogram of snow contains uh, about 100, 100, 110 so grams of hydrogen. So let's go ahead and do some stellar-based proton-proton fusion, which would never work on Earth for a whole bunch, bunch of reasons, because you need temperatures in the excess of multi-millions of Kelvin. You need tens of millions of Kelvin, which you can do on Earth, but it still isn't the best choice. Um, millions and millions of atmospheres of pressure and high density and confinement time. And no one's trying to make a reactor based on this other than some cold fusion charlatans did. Other than some cold fusion charlatans were attempting. But yeah, proton-proton fusion, you're better off using enriched deuterium tritium fuels such as the ones used in ETER, but let's say you somehow do it by the result of magic like you like XKCD likes to often mention. And you just do one gram of it. So that's gonna figure out to over 85 gigajoules of energy, which is enough to power your house for a couple of years. But you've just released that the equivalent of um 20 kilograms of TNT in your driveway, so it's going to make a small crater, produce a lot of debris, and really confuse your insurance agent. Um, I, you still wouldn't be able to pull it off. Maybe you'd compress snow to stellar densities with a small tokamak with a bunch of Nobel Prizes duct taped to it, duct taped to the hood of your Ford F-150 or whatever it is you're trying to do this in. But no, don't even try doing it. But obviously, don't try to do this. If you're frustrated by winter, invest in a snowblower, not a stellarator. But I'm kind of surprised they didn't go that far on this channel. So it turns out Matt was right about the flamethrower being impractical. Yeah. Although, if you're not careful with the jet engine snowblower, you might run into a different problem. <laughs> and both of those are practical, but compared to um, trying to do proton-proton fusion in your driveway. <laughs> I love these videos as always. Thanks so much for the recommendation, and thanks so much for watching. I'll see you next time.